Okay? Now, I don't want to jump too far ahead, but what does Paul call Jesus in the New Testament? He specifically calls him this. Well, that's John. But I'm saying Paul says, Christ our Passover lamb is sacrificed for us. Okay, so this is all going to prefigure Christ. But you're right. Now, just so you know, and I've said this in that last sermon I didn't, we'll get that out of the way too, is when John stood up and said, behold the lamb of God, the word he used in the New Testament was this. It was amnas. Okay, amnas. All right. In the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the amnas is the sacrificial lamb. It's the same word. He could have said, you know, the lamb of whatever and not used a sacrificial term, but he used the term amnas. It was apparent right from the beginning of his ministry when John the Baptist looked at him and said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He was referring back to the Old Testament symbolism of Christ being our sacrifice. And then Paul confirms that when he says, Christ, our Passover lamb, is sacrificed for us. That's in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And... Uh, you think I know that and I'm Mr. Smart? That's because that's what I'm supposed to preach on here. So it just happens, you know, it has nothing to do with me being smart. It's just what I'm supposed to preach on if that comes through. So, um, but 1 Corinthians chapter 5, it says, Christ, our Passover lamb, is sacrificed for us. What we're eating now, all, all pictures Jesus. Go ahead. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month. For all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Okay, let's stop right there. What, does, what is that telling you? Let me erase all of this because it's getting in the way. What does that tell you right there? What was the day that they were to take it into their home? Okay. And, no, into their home. On the 10th. And then they're to slaughter it on the 14th. Do you know any parallel in the New Testament to that? How many days is this? Be careful how you answer. <coughs> How many days is this? Count the first day is what I'm getting at. Five days. Okay? What is that picture? When did Christ present himself to Jerusalem? Yeah. Palm Sunday. Yeah. When was he crucified? Five days later. Okay? He was inspected for five days, just like this. This is he, They were to take this lamb into their home, have it with them, ensure that it was out with, without blemish, without defect, that's right, and then after that they were to confess their sins over it and slaughter it. And they would transfer their sin to this animal. It was only a temporary thing, but that was their redeemer. This redeemed them, okay? This is how they, 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 they paid for their sins or uh, whatever. I, I, anyway, the five days. And this is the five days of Christ presenting himself to the people of Israel. And then what time do you, did you say? You just read that again in verse 13 or verse uh, whatever you just read. What time of the day is he slaughtered? And what time of the day did Christ die? He was the sacrifice. He died and he was in the grave by twilight. It was, at the, it was actually at the hour of sacrifice, which would have been at three in the afternoon. Okay, he was in the grave by twilight. So even back then, this is all prefiguring the work of Christ, right? Remember they said, hurry, the Sabbath is coming and we got it, you know, whatever. Okay, oh, so anyway, once again, everything we're reading is all just prefiguring the greater redemption of Jesus. This is the redemption of the Israelites all prefiguring the greater work of Christ. Okay, go ahead. Oh, then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides of, and tops of the door frames of the houses. Okay, now what? Everybody do that. Put blood on the, the top and the door frames of your houses. Somebody else do it. Go ahead. Just make the motions. What are you kind of making? Cross. A cross. You're, you're crossing over, right? Okay. And then what does it say in the New Testament where our, our hearts are circumcised, right? you know, the blood, the, 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 the symbology is that this was a, a physical representation of the blood. We are to have a spiritual representation of the blood. We're to convert our hearts through Christ. But it kind of makes a cross if you think of them going out there and just doing this, right? See what I'm saying? It's the doorway of the house. Well, this is our heart. And, you know, people love to use the terminology, the door of the heart, but what does it say in uh, Revelation 3? I'm knocking at the door, and people always equate that with their heart. Now, some people will dispute that, and they say it has nothing to do with the heart, but you know what? He's got to knock somewhere. And where is it that we are pricked? It's in our heart, okay? Anyway, the symbolism is there. It doesn't have to be exact. It's symbolism. 
that points to something else. And I always try to tell people that if something is exact, then you're talking about the same thing. That's why typology is never exactly the same. It alludes to something else. The, this alludes to the cross of Jesus. Okay, go ahead. Then they are to take some of the blood. Oh, I already read that. Oh, uh, the same night they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire, along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Okay, and what is the bread made without yeast? Okay, and what does that uh, picture? Once again, we talked about this last night. Well, it, more specifically, the bread. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Okay, and what is yeast a picture of? Puffing up. Puffing up. Sin. Sin makes us puff up. Okay, and uh, I'm kind of giving away a lot of my sermon because this is exactly what I'm going to be speaking on. But we might as well get through it here anyway. Is that when you put yeast into bread, it causes it to puff up. So they were told... No yeast. This is a picture of purity. Okay? And it's also a picture of haste. And he, he says that. Is it a contaminating agent then, kind of, in a way? Oh, yeah. Throughout the Bible it is. It's, it's, it's an agent, just like sin, gets into our life. And when I give you, if you're here, if I do this sermon, I keep saying if because it's been changed four times. But if it happens, you will see how effective yeast is in a real world demonstration that you are not going to believe. If you've never heard this before, you're not going to believe how effective yeast is. It is astonishingly effective. As a matter of fact, who might not be here for that sermon? I think you're all going to be here, but I, I'm going to tell you anyway, and I want you to keep this to yourself, okay? Because I'm going to give this as an example and you can sleep through this portion of the sermon. <laughs> the Boudin Bakery yeah. in San Francisco, California put yeast into some bread before California was a state in the territorial period of, of California, right? Over 150 years ago, they put some yeast into the bread and they mixed it up. And before they cooked that bread, they cut off a piece and they put it off to the side. And the next day, they took that piece, it's called a starter, and they put it into the next batch of dough the next day. And they have done this every single day without any addition of any yeast at all for over 150 years, the same yeast that they put in there on that first batch of dough is being used to this day. And that's why it's such a peculiar bread. Sour, San Francisco sourdough bread is it's the status around the world because of this particular yeast that they use. And they've been using one, one heap of yeast for over 150 years, day by day by day. That is how pervasive the effects of sin are in mankind. And that's the picture that's being made here. No yeast. No yeast. They are told, and we're going to get to this later, um, the, uh, as a matter of fact, that maybe in this chapter, but I'll tell you now in case we don't, they are told that they are to take all the yeast out of their house during, yeah, during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which they do every year, and they're to do this to this day. All yeast. And what they do, this is just fun. They have a little ceremony that they do in Israel and in the Jewish homes all around the world year after year. They take yeast and they hide it all around the house and then the children go and look for it. And then they clear it all out. Well, you know, I was at some Orthodox Jew house. Um, I interviewed him for a college project. And uh, he says, well, what we do is we take it and we put it in the freezer until uh, Passover is over. Well, that's violating the precept because, you know, they, they don't, it's the yeah, house. it's still in the house. That's right. And the Lord says, no yeast. And that is a picture of us in Christ, okay? That's how we're supposed to live. What's that? You sure they weren't Reformed Jews? Well, whatever they were. They, oh, maybe it was Reformed, whatever. Yeah, what, whatever they were, I just went to interview them about what they believed. And I, maybe it was Reformed too. But uh, they attend one of these places here in Sarasota. They were Holocaust survivors. And uh, it was funny. I, I, I was told to interview somebody of a different religion. And I said, I want to do a rabbi. That's all. I didn't want to do anybody else. You know, I, all these other religions are hokey pokey. I want to know what the rabbis think. Not one rabbi in Sarasota would talk to me. They wouldn't do it. And so he says, I've got a guy that attends in my congregation. I'll give you his name and you talk to him. I don't know why, but I, 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 maybe it's because they don't know their Bible and they don't want to look stupid. I have like no idea. Yeah, it was like they were. You know, I called a couple of them. They're like, no, we don't want to do that. And he's not interested. I'm like, he's just asking college questions. I mean, you know, whatever. But he gave me these nice old people and uh, there you go. But um, the, the yeast is so pervasive in our life that it causes sin, or the sin in our life is so pervasive that we just can't get away from it. You know, that's just the way it is, and that's what this is picturing. Okay, so anyway, I'm sorry I gave you part of the sermon, but I may never give it, and I thought I'd share that with you guys, is this is what 
yeast does. It lasts and it lasts and it lasts. And it goes down through the generations. And that's just like us. We transmit our sin through our children. They are already sinners the day they're born because of the sin in us. That's the, that's the picture of what's being given in this book, is that we are already condemned. John 3.18. People love John 3.16, great verse. But he says, those who don't believe in the Son are condemned already. King David said in the 51st Psalm, I was born in iniquity. And so we need to have a new birth, John 3.3. Without that new birth, we can never come to God. Okay, that's the point of all of what's going on right here. Go ahead. Okay, that same night they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or cooked in water, but roasted over the fire, head, legs, and all inner parts. Okay, now I've heard some, some symbology about this. I'm not going to get into it because I don't know if it's true, but some of the symbology that I've heard comes from Judy, Jewish sources actually points to Jesus in uh, the way they prepare the lamb and what they do with the entrails and all that. I don't know if that's true, so I don't want to give it to you today. But why would it say, nor boiled, don't eat it raw, but roast it in the fire? This kind of goes to something I talked about last night. I, I brought up way too much. It was a real detailed sermon. It was on Yom Kippur. The reason why is because um, the sacrifice on Yom Kippur, they took the blood, they sprinkled it on the mercy seat, they, uh, you know, they did their things with it, they burned the fat in a certain place, and then after that, the hide, the flesh, and the offal, everything was taken outside the city and it was burned because it was unclean, okay? And so this is kind of the same thing. You're to roast it, nothing is to be left behind. All right, just the symbology is that we are to completely be consumed by Christ or consume Him in our lives. We shouldn't have... Every, every type of sacrifice, in other words, has a meaning. This sin offering is to be burned outside the camp because it's, we're getting rid of the sin in our lives. This offering is to be eaten, the fellowship offering, what we'll get to someday. People went down to Jerusalem and they said, I want to have a fellowship offering with the Lord. Well, they would eat that. Part of it would go to the priest, part of it would go on the altar, and they would eat it. And that's because you're fellowshipping with God. You're dining with God. Okay? All of these sacrifices and the way that they are handled point to our relationship with Jesus. Okay? This particular one, nothing is to be left over. We're not to leave any part of it behind. We're to consume the whole thing. Okay, go ahead. It says yes. here in mind that roasting it, the head, the legs, and the inner parts was the method that wandering shepherds used to cook meat. Well, that could be. Yeah, that's not why God did it, you know, but that could be. Wandering shepherds, whatever. But he was making a point about the type of sacrifice and how it applies to the Christian life. But that very well could be, you know. Probably going to make scrapple. Oh, yeah. Oh, boy. Anybody here ever had scrapple? You can get it at the store to this day. It's been around since I was young, but it is all the parts that nobody wants, and that stuff is whoo, powerful good. I love it. Oh, oh, my oldest brother would probably kill for it. I don't know. But me, I, I wouldn't kill anybody for it, but I certainly love it. Oh, about what? It? it might be. You go to the bacon section, and it's right there in the bacon section. It's called Scrapple. And if you've never had it, it is unbelievably good. It's what? Just, like, just cook it like... Mom can tell you most, but you cut it off. It, it's like a little loaf of this stuff, and you cut it off and cook it like bacon, kind of. It is, it is unbelievably good. Scrapple is, I'm telling you, if you've never had it and you like that kind of thing, but like she said, just don't read what it has in it because you'll be like, I'm not eating that. But, oh. like that may be how they, how they treated this. I mean, there had to be some way yeah. to cover the, the flavor of these inner parts. I don't know. Oh. Who knows? I have no idea. But yeah, they had bread and they had bitter water. Bitter herbs, I'm sorry. Bitter Who knows? Probably. Yeah. But now you know what my mother used to feed us growing up. Here's your scrapple. Here's the... Oh, so good. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's it. Okay, well, where are we here? We're at uh, verse 10. Yeah. Do not leave any of it until morning. If some is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it. With your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and oh, Charlie's in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> eat, 
Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Eat it in haste. In other words, it's a picture that they are about to be redeemed and you're to eat it in haste. And throughout the Bible, when they observe these feasts, you're going to see the terminology like in a, a probably uh, the book of Kings. It'll say the priest cooked the Passover lamb and served it to the people quickly. Everything is done in haste. And you're going to see this again and again as you're reading through the book of Kings and maybe Nehemiah. I don't know where. I, I, I'm not remembering right offhand. But you'll see it several times 